It's now time for member statements. I recognize the member for Algoma, Manitoba. Well, thank you, Speaker. And it's the month of May, and May is Lyme Awareness Month. And I don't know, Lyme warriors work in mysterious ways. I look around the legislature right now, and I see that there's a Lyme that has reached your desk, Speaker, and also the clerk's table and down by the sergeant at arms. I don't know how they work, but they work in mysterious ways. I'd like to call a couple of the pages up, please. I want to give you guys the Lyme Task Report. And it was established in 2018, and there's a lot of good work that was done in there by a lot of members. I also have ribbons for each of the members inside the House to pass that along in order to raise awareness for Lyme disease. The task force was comprised of Dr. Aldenstein from the University of Toronto, Dr. Beverly Bateman, Dr. Kim Cook, Lori Dennis, Greg Ferrand, Dr. Elliot Jackson, Jacobson, Ms. Linda Kelso, Catherine Ken Ken Kinzella, Dr. Gordon Coe, Angela, Dr. Angela Lee, Dr. Vet Lloyd, myself, along with Dr. Mary Matheson, Dr. Peter Ogleza, Lacey Phillips, Scott Weiss, Melanie Willis, and a whole lot of other individuals who have brought together in order to bring awareness to Lyme disease. We don't have all the answers, but this is a good point that we can start with. The point of Lyme disease, and I challenge everybody, Lyme disease is something that you can do, and to raise awareness, what you do is you grab a piece of lime and you bite into it, you post up your picture, and you put up a lime fact. Take a bite out of lime, folks. Mm. I have to advise the member that uh, he's not allowed to use props in the House, but we'll have to study the matter as to whether or not fruit qualifies as a prop <laughs> on Lyme, today, Lyme Disease Awareness Day. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like, to Frank, I'd like to quote Frank Curry, a sailor on a Canadian Corvette. What a miserable, rotten, hopeless life. An Atlantic so rough it seems impossible that we can continue to do this unending pounding and still remain in one piece. The crew in almost stupor from the nightmarishness of all of it. And still we go on, hour after hour. The first weekend in May is set aside to remember those who served in the Royal Canadian Navy, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and the Canadian Merchant Navy during the Battle of the Atlantic, the longest battle of the Second World War. It was the Royal Canadian Navy's defining moment, escorting large merchant Navy convoys that carried vital supplies between Canada and the United Kingdom. The Battle of the Atlantic was a lifeline for democracy and the key to the ultimate victory. Over 2,000 courageous members of the Royal Canadian Navy gave the ultimate sacrifice during the Battle of the Atlantic. For over six years, Canadian sailors protected Allied supply lines from German ships and U-boats, completing over 25,000 merchant voyages, transporting over 165 million tons of cargo, as well as personnel. Beginning with only 13 ships and 3,500 sailors, by the end of World War II, the Royal Canadian Navy consisted of 375 fighting ships and more than 110,000 sailors and officers. Her Majesty's Canadian ship York, Toronto's Navy Reserve Division, the largest in Canada with over 320 sailors, is with us today in the Members Gallery and will be parading from York Dundas Square to Nathan Phillips Square for a special commemorative ceremony this Sunday, May 5th at 11 a.m. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we've talked a lot about Ontario's health care system here recently, with different opinions about its future and its impact on Ontario families. And I, like many of my colleagues, believe that our health care system is a sacred pillar of our Canadian society, and we're immensely proud of the work that our health care professionals do every single day. And at some point, point in our lives, all of us here in Ontario, and all Ontarians will come into contact with our public health care system. Universal health care is something we appreciate after the fact. It's not something we ever look forward to, but in, most, in our most vulnerable moments, our doctors, nurses, support staff, and the tireless frontline workers are there for us when we need them, free of charge. 
Over the last couple of months, I have spent a lot of time in hospitals in Toronto with my husband, with my husband as he battled with a life-threatening illness. The care he received was remarkable. While the patients slept, doctors and nurses worked tirelessly to care for them with the same diligence and compassion that one would give to their own family members. Because of their care, I was able to bring my husband home after a life-saving operation to continue his recovery. Our healthcare workers deserve the very best. We need, support, we need to support our care providers by hiring more, providing the best technology, repairing and building new hospitals. I urge each and every member in this House to recommit to investing in public health care, and if you have doubt, spend a day at the hospital with the frontline staff, and trust me, you will know what I mean. Thank you, Speaker. Member Statements. The member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, once I was approached by a principal and asked me a question. There are two brothers. One come on Monday, the other one comes on Tuesday, and they follow the pattern. Why? The answer was they only had one winter suit. Mr. Speaker, one in five students in the region of Peel face barriers related to poverty, coming to school hungry, lacking basic necessities as such as winter clothes and school supplies prevent them from fully participation in the school and classroom. Thankfully, there is an amazing organization that is able to help these students in need. Mr. Speaker, it is an honor to rise today to spread the word about Peel Learning Foundation, a community-based charitable non-profit organization that raises funds to enable students within the Peel District School Board to provide resources to help overcome various barriers. Currently, it is focused on two main programs, Student Emergency Needs Program and Student Backpack Program. Mr. Speaker, it was my, I was fortunate enough to be able to join the launch in February. In my riding of Mississauga Malton, we are working closely with the Peel Learning Foundation with our Fueling Healthy Minds program, which aims to connect community corporate donors and schools. The program aims to provide nutritious breakfast to the students. In the early stages of this program, we're only working with two schools, and hopefully we aim to expand the program to all schools in Mississauga Malton, although our end goal is to make the program as self-sustainable as possible. I encourage every school board to observe and follow the steps of the Peel Learning Foundation for the success of their communities. Please visit peellearningfoundation.org to directly donate and learn more ways to get involved. I wish the Peel Learning Foundation prosperity and success so more students can develop and flourish. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. On March 8th, almost eight weeks ago today, 86 Windsor Essex Health Unit nurses, members of Ontario Nurses Association Local 8, were forced out on strike. All 86 of these nurses are women, and all they are asking for is equity, to be paid the same 2% wage increase that has been given to male-dominated municipal professions. The nurses have my support, my community's support, and they have the support of nurses across the country as well. In a great act of solidarity, nurses from the Canadian Federation of Nurses, the United Nurses of Alberta, and the Prince Edward Island Nurses Union have all sent donations to ONA Local 8, encouraging them to stay strong in their fight. I've spoken in this House before about the need to get the employer back to the table to negotiate with the nurses. But I think it's important to raise this issue again because next week is Nursing Week here in Ontario. We in this House and across the province will spend the next week honouring and congratulating our local nurses whose hard work and dedication keeps us, our families and friends safe and healthy. And as we offer those messages of support next week, this Conservative government needs to ask itself whether it truly supports nurses and the life-saving services that they provide. They continue to cut funding to public health programs, and that impacts not only the livelihoods of our nurses, but also the safety of our communities. My wish for this upcoming Nursing Week is for a swift and fair resolution to the strike in Windsor-Essex so that ONA Local 8 can get back to work providing vital care, which is exactly where they want to be.
Thank you. Member statements. The member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, over the past few weeks, our world has experienced a wave of violence and hatred. People have been targeted at their places of worship, while surrounded by loved ones, and at their most vulnerable. In New Zealand, two mosques in Christchurch were attacked. In Sri Lanka, two weekends over, ago over Easter, hundreds lost their lives in another attack of hatred and fear. And just this last weekend at Chabad of Poe Synagogue, outside of San Diego, a woman lost her life as she ran to protect the rabbi from a lone gunman. After the tragedy in Sri Lanka, I attended two vigils in my riding. It was moving to see the Sri Lankan community of Scarborough Guildwood unite in this time of grief and sadness. Tragedy is no less felt as time goes on, as today we remember the Holocaust and the six million Jews who lost their lives and experienced horror. This past weekend, I joined those in my, in my community who gathered to remember the terrible tragedy of the Armenian Genocide at the end of World War I. Each vigil and memorial serves as a, a reminder of our need for resilience and a demonstration of strength. May we all find some light which dispels hatred and fear and anger. Our communities must come together to be stronger and work together so that we can be more prepared for our province's future. It is our duty as elected representatives to uphold the values of inclusion, diversity and acceptance as we put forward legislation in this House that strengthens all in our communities. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs> member Statements. The member for Barrie Springwater, Oral Madonto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise in the House today to recognize Toronto Blockchain Week. It's more than a cryptocurrency, and it's something that every business should be paying attention to. Last week, over 1,200 developers, entrepreneurs, dignitaries, investors, and innovators from 20 countries around the world gathered at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre for the inaugural Blockchain Revolution Global Conference. This global conference kicked off the first ever Toronto Blockchain Week to promote and celebrate innovation, featuring over 40 events showcasing this innovative community, including hackathons, open houses, and workshops. The Toronto Kitchener Waterloo Corridor is one of the fastest growing fintech hubs on the planet, with over 190 fintech startups located in the region. It's groundbreaking events like these that send a clear signal to the world that Ontario is open for business and open for jobs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member Statements. The member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This government is making it harder for the people of Ontario to access justice. Earlier this month, the government announced shocking and cruel cuts to legal aid Ontario that will hurt the most vulnerable. Hamilton Community Legal Clinic, which is part of Legal Aid Ontario, serves the residents of my riding of Hamilton Mountain. HCLC does a lot of important work that is now threatened by these cuts. HCLC helps people access ODSP and OW. It helps tenants fight illegal evictions. It helps precarious workers that are treated unfairly by their employers. It helps newcomers and refugees wade through the complex immigration system. It helps workers who were injured on the job and denied compensation. On top of the cuts to legal aid, this government is changing how and when a government can be held liable and taken to court. These changes could apply retroactively. There are cases that are before the court right now that will be impacted. If this government truly believes in its actions, it would not be reducing access to justice for Ontarians and leaving people to fend for themselves. Access to justice is fundamental to our democracy. This government should be empowering its citizens and improving access, not diminishing it. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. For Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On April 24th, I was honoured to attend the official groundbreaking of Ed's House, Northumberland's hospice. Mr. Speaker, this was an incredible groundbreaking. 
that was born out of the fruits of so many in our community who've come together to make sure that compassionate end-of-life hospice care is a reality in our community. And I was honoured to stand there to announce our government's $1.2 million investment into the capital construction and, of course, our $630,000 ongoing operating funding. Mr. Speaker, so many in our community have come together to make this project a reality, and it spans multiple governments. It spans so many in our community who've linked arms to make this a reality. I'd like to especially thank Gordon and Patty Lay, campaign co-chairs, early volunteers with a vision, Mr. Speaker, Stuart Richardson, who's also chair of the building committee, Selena Forsyth, Ray Lobin, chair of the board of Community Care Northumberland, Sherry Gibson, the project lead, Linda Kay, campaign director, Trish Baird, executive director, key donors, Ed and Diane Lawrence. Brian and Kim Reed, and of course members of our building committee, executive members, and all directors involved who've made compassionate end-of-life care in Northumberland Peterborough South a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yeah. Colleagues, colleagues, on all sides of this house, we work in a partisan environment. But we should never, ever forget the necessity of respect and humanity in our political processes. As such, today I offer my sincere condolences to the family of the late Peter Tinsley, who passed away peacefully on April the 26th. Peter was an accomplished professional. He had a 28-year career in the Canadian Armed Forces as a prosecutor, practiced law in Babel, sat on many, many local commissions and boards, and served as the head of the Military Police Complaints Tribunal for Canada. And uh, I should also note that Peter was a federal Liberal candidate for the riding of Prince Edward Hastings, who ran against me in 2011. And I recall we had many, many interesting conversations. I remember when we both made submission to the Electoral Boundaries Commission uh, for changes, uh, with, which come up, and just to show you that there was no partisanship in it whatsoever, uh, neither one of our suggestions were accepted. <laughs> But while well, we did have some different perspectives as to the directions and the roles and the responsibilities of government, we did share a common appreciation for the democratic institutions and the positive role that an elected official like each one of us here today, the role that we can play in helping shape our province and our country. So I trust Peter's legacy and his accomplishments will remind us that humanity and politics can be shared and celebrated and not be lost in partisan discourse. Peter, rest in peace. God bless. Thank you. That concludes our member statements. The 